Thank you. Have fun, Dave. Cool. All right, can you all hear? You all can hear me. Cool. Um, so I just want to tell you, I, I work for Cisco, but just as a disclosure, uh, I am not Cisco. I'm going to say things that don't have anything to do with Cisco. And I'm going to present these slides next week to people, and I, I'm going to do things like I'm not even going to mention the vendors that we're talking about so I can say things. And since we're here at DevNet, I mean, what's cooler? I mean, there's, there's beer right over there, and we're just best session ever. Best place. So first of all, why are we here? Um, I've been through this a number of times where um, people write a really cool application, and then they go to deploy it. And it's like, the, it turns out the application has to connect to some other application. And it's like, how do you connect to some other application without uh, you, you securely? Because um, one of the things I do personally, I'll get to in a minute, but is those application credentials that are used for one application to talk to another are often exploited to do bad things with your applications. So uh, why am I here? Uh, for the last two and a half, three years, I've been studying the, the practices and runbooks by the same types of people that uh, broke into Sony. Um, there's groups like uh, the Mandate Report came out, and they targeted, put together groups called APT1, APT12, they call, which are essentially uh, sections of militaries that are owned by uh, countries. And they're very well-funded adversaries, but they have a very normal way that they do things. So the uh, funny thing is, uh, just over a year ago, I was at first conference in Amsterdam, and I was going to talk about why we're here. And I said, OK, do, does anyone know about the OpenSSL incident? And it was the week that Heartbleed hit. So everyone said, yeah, Heartbleed's a big deal. Well, well, actually, that's not why I was showing this. The reason I was showing this was, for a period of time last year, oh, my laser's not working. Darn it, I love the laser. Oh, well. Um, for a period of time, the OpenSSL org website, which is supposed to look like that, in instead it looked like that. So the service provider that OpenSSL is running on runs on VMware. And so what hit the media was there is a hypervisor exploit in the wild for VMware. And the, the company VMware, they took this very seriously because they thought if there is such a thing in the wild, they want to fix it or they want to debunk that it wasn't their problem in the first place. And the latter is actually the case. What they found out to, after looking into it was there were, the service provider that was running openSSL.org was only using username and passwords for administrator accounts to manage all their systems. So one of the administrators, and this is a recurring trend, administrators and their laptops are targeted by nation states because administrators and their laptops have cool stuff on their laptops. They have things like scripts that can do stuff. They have administrators that log into them. And so anyway, that's, that's how this site was compromised. But I, I still just love this slide. But. And with that, um, I came up with this stat last year that 5% of all system administrators or their laptops are, laptops are compromised at any given time. And if you want to know how I came up with that stat, you can just ask Dave. No one asks, so I'll go on. Um, also, <laughs> well, besides phishing, Phishing is a, interesting emails that show up in your inbox. One of the ways that you get at administrator laptops, phishing emails. The other one that's popped up recently is what we call malvertising. We all go to certain websites that we trust. I was going to say CNN, but I, I, I don't really trust CNN. Um, San Jose Mercury News. You go to San Jose Mercury News. Sometimes their advertisers may be one of those ones that's hosting malware. And that's one way that administrator laptops get jacked up. And I'm going to say right now, I have more slides than I have time to talk about. <laughs> so I'm going to try to go quick. But this slide, uh, Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, I can't do a slide deck without putting one of their slides up. And this one shows how over the last uh, four or five years, the main way of breaking into websites went from tampering, or spyware, to the number one way of breaking into stuff is stolen credentials. And on this one, this is the most recent DBIR, and they had a quote. And their quote was, well, we've tried to refrain from best practice advice this year. There's no way of getting around the fact that credentials are literally the keys of the kingdom. If possible, improve them with second factor, hardware token, or mobile app, or monitor login activity for unusual activities. 60% uh, of the mistakes are just caused by people, is what that says. I don't know what else to say about that. OK, so let's get, in, get into this. Oh, <laughs> uh, one more thing. This one came out this year. Out of 
all the investigations that caused data breaches that Verizon investigated last year, 99% of them, 0.9, were for CVEs or more than year old. If, uh, CVE is uh, when you disclose a, a, a vulnerability in an application, a common vulnerability something, exploit. Um, which means that if you patched in the last year, those wouldn't have happened. Okay, so um, nation state run book. So this is how it usually happens. Um, as I was saying, a, a user is targeted and they get some really interesting email or they go to malvertising and they get malware on their, their, their laptop. Oh, something called WCE or, or Mimikatz. I prefer WCE because it actually installs as a service. But Mimikatz is, is started. And at that point, a privileged user or privileged application, application is important today, logs through that account. And I've seen that happen with things like, say, Trend Micro goes to update DAT files. That's an example of an application connecting to a machine. Infects into other machines in the data center. And then when a real super user walks by that machine, that machine has also got a credential editor on it, steals their credentials, and then poof, you're a puppeteer. The entire data center has been compromised. Um, interesting thing about that, uh, Flash is one of the more recent ones. I, I, actually, my list of targeted plugins is, is a little out of date. But the interesting thing about this is all of the Fortune 500 companies these days, these nation states have the, the ability to take existing malware and recompile it for your company. So uh, Google, when they send interesting malware to Google, it's going to have one antivirus signature that none of the antivirus vendors have ever seen. When Intel gets it, they're going to have a different signature. And there's some interesting things they can do with that. Like if one of those companies reports that virus back to an antivirus vendor, their hat's been tipped and they go, ah, they found that one. Let's go to the next level. And they take it up. So infestation, remediation. <laughs> I, I don't know why I laugh at myself sometimes. I, I'm not that funny. Um, but anyway, the, the first idea is you need to use, like I was saying, multi-factors or token back to the Verizon report. So first of all, the, the super user logs in with uh, multi-factor credential, not just a password, with scoped access. We'll get back to that, that in a minute. And then the malware is not propagated through the data center. And by the way, this is some of the first animation I've ever did. And so I, I just had to point it out. I, li I just liked it. Second, um, the privileged user application has also has scoped access and is denied access to those desktops. That's part of that scope thing. And so the malware doesn't go into, oh, and they, go, they log in through hardened endpoints, and then the malware doesn't go into the data center. And then finally what we do is we upgrade older operating systems and, and based on and train users. By the way, I've done a lot of research over this over the last year, and I'm doing a whole talk next week, but I'm going to skip it today and how you make endpoints better for the sake of time, because I've already burned through 12 minutes. And the initial attack fails. Awesome. OK, so you may have noticed that was all about people. How do you give an application one of these? Well, I get that complaint a lot. Um, but anyway, the, the, the whole, one of the whole ideas of, about breaking this, this run book to put these in is in the old days, like in the, the example I gave with OpenSSL, you have an administrator running with their credentials and the password, logging in from anywhere that's convenient for them, and that's how the site was compromised. So the whole idea that the breaking this run, nation state run book is you scope that out. So you restrict how you can get to production resources from where so that their endpoints locked out. And then you add in additional controls, like a security control point. We traditionally call these jump boxes. But the difference between a, just a jump box and a security control point, security control points have additional logging. They require a smart card. And they've been locked down in different ways. They're, they're a security control point as opposed to a jump box convenience control point. And then the, the users have their, their stuff. Anyway, that's the general concept. Um, and I just have to say, one, one of the, the best ways that we've found to detect these and stop these things is sandbox detonation. If you get a brand new, what appears to be a zero day binary that comes through your, your network, your firewall, your Juniper firewall, your Palo Alto, they are not going to see these. Even your Cisco firewall is not going to see this unless it's tied in with firepower. Uh, but things like that, what the firepower technology does, and I said I wasn't going to plug anyone, was it can actually take what looks like a binary and fire it up and do sandbox detonation on an operating system to determine what that would have done if it got into your network. So it may still hit the first person, 
But at that point, you have discovered that, that binary that can be then applied to the rest of your folks to save them. Big deal. But the other ones, this whole monitoring thing, our CSERT team is really into it. Um, big things for us, passive DNS, NetFlow, uh, host space. Big problem for infestation is those lab machines that we all have. We have lab development machines that are sitting in closets that aren't patched because they, they're not production. No one really pays attention to them. But if you have some sort of hips or other on them, that's how we found a lot of the ways that they got into us. And when I say us, I'm talking about the entire Fortune 500. We're not special. We're just a big company. Um, but logging all those in the same place so they can be correlated is a big idea, good idea. 15 minutes. So control use cases. Um, so for the next few, I'm going to apply those concepts to a few different applications, and then I want to talk about what you can do as developers to do these same kind of things. So this first one is something we did. Uh, this is kind of Windows specific, since I said group policy object. But you, in a Windows environment, you can scope access with GPOs. The, the short thing is, Administrators are locked out of desktops. You cannot use, the point of this GPO is you cannot, as an administrator credential, you can't take one of these and log into a user desktop because they can still steal your hash and then this is now irrelevant. So you keep administrators out of untrusted machines, which we call desktops and lab machines. Next thing we do is we scope out um, application control. So like I was saying, we had our antivirus update system, Central, would push out DAT files to all the different machines. It had usually a, a local administrator writes to all those machines. It didn't need that. All it needed was the ability to get to the one directory that had the DAT files it had to update. But also, those, those special administrator accounts that can do the same kind of stuff, they had to be locked out from everything besides their own systems. They can't log into Active Directory. They can't log into desktops. And finally, the Active Directory folks, we actually did a bunch of stuff here, but with these accounts, because these are the super, super accounts, the keys of the keys, I like to call them, when they log in with their hard credentials, they can't even do stuff like, they do an interactive login in their machine, they can't establish outbound network connections. So their credential is limited to scope down to just the machine that they're working on. They're, so their credential can't be leveraged to do other stuff. So, um, this can be applied to Puppet 2, but the, sorry, Linux 2. But the whole idea here is, I call it security configuration management. Instead of just system management, it's stuff that looks for security controls that have been disabled or otherwise, and puts them back. But I'm gonna just gloss over this one to get to the next. Because uh, we have, uh, if you needed to take, apply this to protecting, um, say, your networking devices, you're using some company to do networking stuff, right? <laughs> it's a fair thing, <laughs> fair, fair guess. So here's the networking gear. You probably have network management infrastructure. So for the network management infrastructure that programmatically does apply things across the board, it needs to be scoped down to the accounts it can use to do stuff. But also just the, which machines are allowed to connect to these devices needs to be restricted. But the other side, since this, none of the networking vendors that I either alluded to or didn't allude to support multi-factor, we have to give multi-factor to those vendors. So most of that support is done through SSH. So you put an um, a ACL filter so that SSH can only come from our security control point. And that security control point requires multi-factor. We've just given that vendor multi-factor administrative support. So if you just look at it, these are two different accounts. This account is the actual administrator. He has a, a smart card. Oh, the, sorry, the administrator has two accounts. This is their account that's tied to a smart card to get to the jump box. And then they have another account. It could be a, sh a shared enable account, if you like that kind of thing. Or this could be the RBAC account that is only used for monitoring router, or sorry, logging into the router base. <laughs> it's really fun when I'm in a hurry, especially when I had a lot of coffee. Uh, um, this is an interesting case that I just wanted to bring up because I, I don't know what kind of applications you all develop. But we have a, a MDM. Oh, my props over there. Imagine I'm holding a phone, uh, a mobile device management vendor to manage all of our devices. And that we called critical infrastructure because it could push whatever type of binaries to all of our mobile devices, so we had to protect it. In the case of this vendor, they were doing both the, the client connections and the administrative access through HTTPS, this, the same protocol. So we couldn't just put an ACL in place, block the administrative here, well, user there. 
So we actually had them in their application, we split up the modules. A couple hosts only ran the administrative modules and the rest ran the client modules so we could apply the same concepts we were doing to those. I'd really like to talk about this one in depth, but I'll just talk about VMware. Um, I'm just gonna uh, escape away from OpenStack. But for VMware, they, VMware also, 10, thank you. VMware also does not support multi-factor. So in order to, since VMware is really important, you can connect to ESX, and if you have the rights, you can, it's one thing in the old days, I've, I know about a couple servers that were physically stolen out of data centers in Israel. But that's, we noticed it. VMware, you could actually steal copies of VMs and no one noticed, a running VM and no one would notice it. So it's important to apply that, this to that as well. Um, same kind of concept, but re really quickly, in our case, we have um, a, mail appliances that run on BSD Unix that do things like um, email security appliance is one of them, runs on BSD. Same, same kind of problem, didn't have access to uh, multi-factors, so we had to give it that. But in the other case, for PowerShell scripts that are running to manage the actual mail servers, we use GPOs to restrict that those accounts were able to do that. First of all, inactive directory or the mail servers only had rights to do that. But second, there's a burden here, um, they could only run those provisioning accounts from those machines. Okay, now here's the stuff I wanted to get to in the beginning. That's why I rushed through everything else. Okay, so like I was saying, back in the old days, you, you created an application and it needs to log into another application on behalf of your uh, initial user. So old school, what we would do is the credential that that machine needed to log into that machine, uh, we'd require that that was in, say, in a file, not in code, and that file, the, the file access is rw dash 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 dash, which requires that you have to do a sudo, the application has a sudo to it, and that sudo is logged so we know whenever that account's used. One of the big problems with this scenario is any user that uses this application, the, the, the generic account that's used to talk to the other one, it has to have the rights of every one of those users in order to do whatever, say, we all have different rights, it has to be able to have the rights of all these different. So you steal that one account, everything goes bad. So, w one of the things that, that we've done for these applications, is we've, we've taken the credentials away from the actual machine. So, and given this machine its own credential. So, in this case, this machine has a credential, it could be something like an SSH key, that it uses on behalf of the application to connect to an application vault and say, hey, I need this application's credentials. In this vault, it could be an HSM, it could be a TPM, I'll talk about what those are in a second and it retrieves the username and password that that application would use to get the other side. Now that is a bump up from what we just said of how that password sort of, it's not just in a file system somewhere, it's kind of harder to steal. And also, we've restricted on from what machines will have access to that username and password, because this vault won't hand that credential out to any machine besides that one, there's checks in place. But still, we had the problem of they're all, that generic account has to have the rights of all those users. So, jump into a messy slide. And what we want to do here is each of these machines would have a certificate, hopefully secured well. And like I said, I'll get to that in a second. And so the machines establish a TLS encrypted tunnel between them. So that's protected. And then we introduced this IETF standard, OAuth. And OAuth's job, it was created with the idea that, um, for Flickr, actually, I could put my pictures on Flickr, and I could tell a print shop, I want you to print these 10 pictures. You can't, I don't want you to see any of my other pictures. Print those, but I don't want to give you my password. I just want to give you permission. So OAuth was actually created to do that thing. So that in this case, we have the encrypted tunnel, and then this user, as they go through this stuff, will have a user flow, so it's not a machine automated steal stuff thing. And so the user actually in a screen will accept, so you have a user giving permission so that over this encrypted tunnel, that application can get a credential that has the specific rights of that user as opposed to the rights of all the users. So this is, this is my great use case. And with five minutes left, oh, so um, certificate storage. 
Hardware security module, that's the best. We have network-based ones now. Our PKI infrastructure that's used to print certificates for every phone that I don't see sitting around this environment. Any of our devices that do secure boot that have their own certificate and hardware, we use hardware-based HSMs to do those. The problem with HSMs is they cost about $18,000 a pop. Actually, there's some cheaper ones, but the ones we use are that much. Um, TPM chips are in, no one has one of those laptops. Oh, this laptop right here probably has a TPM chip in it. Same con and it's the same concept as a smart card, but it's actually inside the computer itself. Uh, Microsoft has launched a whole bunch of stuff with their Hello technologies so that you could store credentials in that securely and do stuff, but more on that later. But I mentioned U uh, USB here because VMware actually has the ability to, if you have your, your certificates on a USB, they have the ability to vMotion from USB physically between um, a virtual machines. And finally, if you have to, files, but we just want to get away from that. So um, I, I'm not actually pick, uh, I, I'm not pitching PX Grid here, but this, some friends of mine wrote it, and I happen to have a patent that's in that technology. That's the other reason I'm pitching. I'm pitching me. Actually, I'm not pitching the company. Um, but I get this complaint all the time. Uh, uh, Dave, I don't know. I know it's certificates. I have to use them. I don't know how. I don't know how to talk to the back end. I don't know how to make them work. How do I do that? Where do I click to make, give my app a certificate? Well, one thing that PXGrid is in setup is they give you the ability to add certificates. They'll even generate self-signed certificates if you want to use those. And by the way, the math is the same on a self-signed certificate as it is for a public certificate. The only difference is you, you have to be in control of your own trust. So in case anyone wants to argue that, I'll, I'll talk about it later. Um, <laughs> I got this, this is a marketing side, sorry. But the idea behind PX Grid is it's a security, mostly a security play now, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Gillis who left the company. But the idea is you, with it is you have all these different sources for information. You have your NetFlow events, you have firewall events, you have MDM events, which is a big deal knowing whether these devices are trusted or not. And you want to share information between them all. So you, what we did in the old days was you would connect them all individually and you get this mesh of stuff that would work hit and miss and some would work or not and some things didn't work. Uh, but it, it really was, it was a fail in the end. And marketing made that animation. I, I don't get to take credit for it. Um, so what PXGrid added was the ability, one framework to do all that. And the way it does it is the same way we do um, instant message, it uses Jabber technology. So what these things do is they actually can subscribe to chat channels does anyone do instant message besides me? OK, <laughs> all right. So you know you can set up a group chat. <laughs> so the whole group can see it. Well, the same concept's there for PXGrid. So uh, you can subscribe to the current threats channel. You can subscribe to the, um, the other MDM channel, trusted device channel. But the thing you can do as a developer, oh, <laughs> here's the thing that tells you this. Um, the grid, they actually use this, uses PKI, so the grid controller has a root cert, and then each of the clients connecting to it would have a different cert, establishes the TLS tunnels for you, and also will validate each of the endpoints for you and helps with discovery. So it's, it's kind of a cool concept. Oh, and you don't have to write code. So in action, like I was saying, I like to have architecture slides instead of marketing. So in this case, depending on what your applications are, I mean, whatever you're doing, instead of sensor or switch, or uh, Firesight Management Center, it could be whatever your apps are, PXGrid can handle the secure communications between them all. Like I said, there's a client that goes into it. Saying best practice, I'm not, I'm not actually pitching it. Oh, and we don't actually make money off PXGrid either. It's, a, it's in the ITF, actually. You, you don't even have to use that product to, to be the grid controller. There's actually other products that can be a grid controller. Um, there's more information on it there. But two minutes left. Uh, another best practice I want to say, um, this is a slide I got from Ken Beck, who's in our security business group. And he created this. And this is their idea for how we're going to do SDN. And this, this slide is actually just a use case of how you could do security investigations. But if you notice, he added in my security control point to connect to these things, different devices, APIC EM, APIC DC, ICE. And then these yellow connections are actually those TLS encrypted tunnels that are managed through this, this central thing. So I just want to give them a quick plug in, in the ways how you, you should do this. So, do you have any questions?